The third aspect of life history theory we'll be looking at involves us considering the optimal clutch size for organisms. So we saw earlier when we were looking at Cole's model and the sharnoff shafer um, modification to it that the birth rate of the semiparous organisms would be equal to the birth rate of the iteroparous organisms plus this term here in order to experience equal fitness. And this term here could become quite large if the juvenile survivorship was small and the adult survivorship was large. And we can actually see some of the trade-offs between survival and reproduction, because you can imagine that if this is large, that might mean that they're having fewer offspring here. So there are a number of different trade-offs that we looked at before. Uh, another trade-off to consider is how many offspring should a female have in a bit more sophisticated manner than just this. This question goes back to a guy called Lack in 1947, asked the basic question, how many eggs um, should a female lay? So evolution should maximize the total number of offspring that survive. So naively, the bird or bug should lay as many eggs as possible. But some will die before maturity, and that is likely to be true for larger clutches in that more will die before maturity in these larger clutches. So if we're thinking about this equation, that means when the birth rate goes up, maybe this value would in fact go down. But we can actually take that into account when we do some calculations. Consider this hypothetical survival curve for young that are produced. So if one egg is laid, that individual has about a 90% chance of surviving. Two eggs are laid, 90%. Three eggs are laid, it goes down to say 85%. And then the more eggs are laid, the lower their survival probability for each of the offspring. So we consider this hypothetical survival probability declining with the number of eggs. We could calculate how many individuals survive by multiplying the number of eggs by the survival probability. And that's a measurement of fitness. So number of eggs times survival probability, these numbers are on this axis. You can see laying one or two eggs, the individuals survive well, but the total number of offspring produced that survive is lower because they're laying fewer eggs. At this extreme, they're laying more eggs, but their survival for each egg is so low not many individuals survive to adulthood. And it's an intermediate value here, where although the individual survival probability of each offspring is lower than it could be, by producing more offspring, there's a more total number of individuals for the next generation. And so if we plotted like this, we would actually get something that looks a lot like stabilizing selection, where the fitness is maximized by laying five or six eggs compared to laying fewer or compared to laying more. So this is a prediction that comes from the notion that survival probability will decline with the number of eggs. So we can compare that to what we actually see in nature for organisms who are laying these eggs. Uh, do we actually see them laying six eggs like this model would predict? Here's an example. Uh, this data comes from this book here. Uh, what they did was they looked at this bird here, Paris Major, and they went to a series of nests and they counted the number of eggs that were in those nests. And then they went back repeatedly and they banded birds and they kept track of all of them. And they were able to count how many of the young survived. So in this plot here, this is the number of eggs that were laid in each of these nests. The blue bars are the number of nests that have that many eggs, right? So most nests had eight or nine eggs. A few had only three or four and a few had 12 or 13. And then they were able to determine how many of the young survived. And that's this red line here. And we can actually see that actually the peak the most individual surviving actually comes from the nests where 12 eggs are laid, which is kind of weird because they're not laying 12, they're laying eight or nine. They're, they're apparently laying fewer than they could be or should be to experience maximum fitness. And they did some follow-up experiments where they added eggs. So they took nests that maybe only had eight or nine eggs and added three more to get them up to 12. And the adults seemed fine, right? They watched the adults, that didn't seem to be an increase in their mortality, and they were able to generate this many more individuals. So this is actually kind of a surprise, right? The previous slide, we had this model, we would expect stabilizing selection to cause the number of eggs to be centered around where the maximum fitness would be generated. But when we actually look in nature, we see that they are laying fewer eggs than we would expect based on directly observing the number of offspring that survive so conceptually, we can create an expectation of this where the fitness versus the number of eggs, there's a peak, stabilizing selection. We would expect to see this many eggs being produced, but when we go out and look in nature, we often see less. 
And so why would that be, right? We might want to ask ourselves, like, what is the cause of there being fewer offspring generated than maybe we would expect there to be? So take a few seconds to think about this. Why do we see less than we would expect? So we can look at something like this. So our previous thinking ignored the survival of the adult to the next reproduction. We're all doing this in one year. And you can think about this almost as like a cost-benefit sort of situation, like from economics. The cost of laying that many eggs goes up with the number of eggs. The benefit is this red line here. That's the number of offspring that survive to become adults on their own. And where is the best cost-benefit ratio? It would actually be here, where the cost is maybe half as much, but three-quarters as many offspring are produced. And by having lower costs, these adults could survive, have a better chance of surviving to the next year, and maybe reproducing again. Remember from our experiments with the rotivers that we looked at, survival and future reproduction declined with current reproduction. So one of the reasons why we may see f less reproduction in nature than we would expect is by considering the long-term reproduction of the adults that are doing this reproduction. And by having less this year than would maximize their fitness for this year, they are perhaps ensuring more reproduction in the future. So a lot of these trade-offs between survival and reproduction, they can get quite complex. Right? This red line was calculated from trade-offs between survival and reproduction in one clutch. And then the explanation here is by also considering the effects of the reproduction on future clutches of these adults. So we had this assumption when we made our model of declining survival with the number of eggs. But we can imagine there are other factors to consider as well. Selection optimizes the resources provided to each offspring so that the mother receives the highest fitness, right? Her fitness is the surviving young plus more reproduction. Offspring survival declines with the number of offspring in that clutch because they're getting less resources per offspring. And we can actually see a number of other examples. This data isn't just this Paris major. This is looking at 26 different families of fish. As the eggs are larger, there are fewer being laid, right? So there's a maximum number of eggs of a certain size that can be produced. The bigger eggs you make that would result in higher chances of survival, you can make fewer of them. The smaller the eggs, more can be produced. Same thing for Drosophila. So we do, in fact, in nature, see this pattern. But we also see data consistent with this profit idea. So remember when we considered Paris Major, I said they could do experiments where they added or removed eggs to the nest. So it turns out they followed up and did a long-term study. So when you add eggs to the nest and then track how many eggs do the daughters produce, it's actually less than when eggs were removed from the nest. Those daughters actually had higher reproduction in their own future lifetimes. And this is actually an entire difference of one out of only, on average, about five or six. So that's like a 10 or 20% increase in reproduction of each of the daughters in nests where eggs had actually been removed. So it's actually even more complicated. So having a fewer number of eggs not only increases the mother's potential to have more reproduction in the future, it also, in fact, increases the reproduction of the daughters that are produced in that nest in the future. So these trade-offs can become very complicated and very detailed. And so in ecology and in demographics, and when we look at individual species in detail, it can quickly become quite complex. Another thing that might be driving this pattern um, may be competition between offspring because the mothers are providing food to their offspring. If there are more of them, they're competing with each other for that food. And we've all seen videos of the mother bird or father bird brings the, the worm back to the nest and all those babies are kind of opening their mouths and competing with each other to try to get that food. It's not like they ever stop when they get food. They keep on begging and begging. And there's definitely competition between the offspring in these nests. And that's another factor that we need to consider is not just parent a hypothetical kind of abstract offspring, but how are the offspring also competing with each other?